Welcome to another In Wheel Time podcast, a 30-minute mini version of the In Wheel Time car show that airs live every Saturday morning, 8 to 11 a.m. Central. This is the world's favorite place to go for podcasting and live streaming. It's the In Wheel Time car talk show. Ahead, NHRA top fuel driver Justin Ashley... Mars has This Week in Auto History, and we'll get you caught up on the stories making automotive news headlines this week. Today's program sponsored by Meekum Auction, Houston. Today is the last day at NRG Center. Howdy, along with Mike out of this world, Mars, we always need more Jeff Zekin. I'm Don Armstrong. Glad you could join us on this Saturday. and uh, Eclipse the, edition. Well, yeah, the pre-eclipse, pre-eclipse. edition. Pre-eclipse. Not, yeah. the, not the Mitsubishi no, what? Not, not the Mitsubishi Eclipse. No, it's not the Mitsubishi. They don't make that anymore, I don't believe, do they? I don't know. I don't think so. What do you mean you don't know? You're the car god. You should know that. In that case, they don't make it because it's a... <laughs> Never mind. Watch next week. You're going to have one to drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, an old one. Yeah. Justin Ashley, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing just fine. We all are doing just fine. Uh, how did you qualify? Where are you? So we are nine. So we ran one run yesterday. We'll have two more today. Uh, so right now we're sitting ninth. We'll see if we can improve upon that uh, this afternoon. How's the season going for you? It's been pretty good. So we raced two races so far. Yep. Uh, went to the quarterfinals in Gainesville. And then ironically... We went to the NHRA Winter Nationals in Pomona, made it all the way down to the finals. Where we were supposed to race against Tony Schumacher, and something that I've never seen in California happen all of a sudden, it started hailing. So what they decided to do is push the race to this weekend, actually this afternoon. Uh, we'll run the final round of the NHRA Winter Nationals in conjunction with the NHRA Arizona Nationals. So how, a lot on the line for us today. <laughs> how in the world do you prepare to run a final round from something that happened a couple of weeks ago in Pomona? How do you do that? How do you mentally do that? Oh, my God, this is my final round at Pomona. Not, but it's a final round in Phoenix. Yeah, we'll move it. It's tricky. It's a weird situation because it's so rare. You don't get to do something like this. Only so often, if you ever get to do it all, ironically, we had the same thing or something very similar happen to us last year where we didn't finish the race in Epping. We finished the race, the Epping race itself in Bristol. So we ran two races in one and we happened to win both of them. So we have some experience, but nonetheless, I mean, I think you just have to treat it like every other round because there's only so much that you can do. It kind of stinks, guys. I mean, to be honest with you, it's tough to wait that long. But it's certainly better than the alternative, which is not to be in the final round at all. Well, so there's we'll yeah. any way that we can get there, it. There's no doubt about that. The other thing is, is that at least you're going to have some qualifying before you actually run the week, the, the race from a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. I think without that, it'd be a very difficult thing to do. But we'll have two qualifying runs for Arizona before we actually get to race that final round uh, for Pomona. So that should hopefully give us a good foundation, hopefully give us a good baseline uh, going into that final round. What do you feel about the track uh, that you've been down once already? I think it's really good. You saw, um, you know, we did okay last night. I think we certainly wanted to run a little bit better. But nonetheless, you saw a lot of cars go down the racetrack and run really fast. uh, High 360s in top fuel and mid to high 380s in funny cars. So the track is really fast. The track surface itself is really good. Um, And in conjunction with the weather here that's been relatively overcast, relatively cool, I think you're going to see a lot of really fast times throughout today and throughout race day tomorrow as well. Yeah, that was my question because you've qualified two weeks ago. Uh, The final's not going to be run, but you've got all the the water grains. You've got the ambient temperature. You've got track conditions. And then, okay, we're going to move. So that's (laughs) the question. I mean, that's... Yeah, that, that's, yeah that's, that just is not an easy thing to yeah. do, especially mentally. For me, uh, I can only imagine as a driver what you go through and going, okay, now this is the final. Okay, this is the final. I got that, and I got that in my brain. But does it really change anything when you get to the staging lane? Well, I think there's two aspects of it, right? I think there's the mental side of it, which more so than anything else, it'll test your patience. Right, because you have that adrenaline going, you're ready to go to the final round, and all of a sudden everything just stops. Yeah, and now you have to wait two weeks before you run it. So I think there's the mental side of it, but then the physical side of it, like you said, the water grains, the track surface, 
track temperature, the air temperature, all that stuff plays a role. And to be honest with you, I think our relationship with Toyota Gazoo Racing North America helps us with that a lot because they have engineers on site at all these different tracks that help us get the data and information that we need when we go place to place. So for us, we're fortunate to be a part of that Toyota family and have that relationship. And I think for us, that gives us a healthy advantage and something that we need and gives us something to to help to tune off of and build that foundation for us. Did you change any team members over the winter break? We did not. So we all stayed intact from the crew chiefs, Mike Green, Tommy DeLago, to the general managers, Dustin Davis and everybody in between. And you know how it is in this sport. There's so much turnover. So I think that was probably the most important thing. And obviously now being a part of the Skag Racing and Skag Power Equipment family, uh, that was the big change for us. And, you know, we couldn't be more excited about it, couldn't be more happy about it. And it's just been uh, an incredible experience so far. So we have a lot of gratitude for the team at Skag Power Equipment for giving us this opportunity uh, to flourish and uh, and run their colors on the side of the race car. But that's been the norm for the team's over the over the course of the, the downtime, over the course of the winter season, not a lot of teams did a lot of changes, than what I understand. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think for the most part, some teams have stayed the same naturally. Right. Yeah, There's been some movement, especially in the crew chief department. That usually happens, obviously, during the wintertime each year. But for the most part, um, it stayed relatively similar, which I think is good for the sport because it breeds good competition. The longer the teams are together generally, the better these cars and the better these teams do. So I think it's a good thing when that happens. But well, speaking of your crew, combining the two events, does does that impact them, the way they do things? So it might. In a situation like this, it's a little bit different because there's no added runs. So when you run into situations like this, sometimes there'll be another run in addition to to finish that final round. But what we're going to do here is the third run of qualifying in Arizona will also count for the NHRA Winter Nationals final. So it'll all be done in that same time period, all within three runs of qualifying. A little more to worry about. It's probably more mental than anything else. But in terms of physical work, because you know how it is, guys. These guys work so incredibly hard. There's no actually added work on top of what they actually do. Already. Well, there's also the money factor, too, because each round costs tens of thousands of dollars. <laughs> and let's face it, I mean, you run the risk of blowing up a motor or pushing a head gasket out or spinning the tires or whatever. And so it's a whole lot better to have three rather than four rounds. Yeah, definitely. I'm a little, I'm like, I want to race anytime we get a chance. Well, of course, yeah. Opportunity. But that's right, typical drivers. What do yeah, you yeah. do? But for us, no, it makes a lot more sense economically. You know, when we when, when we talked to you in Baytown a couple of years ago, we uh, we were all thoroughly impressed by you. I want to know a little bit more about you and your background, being from uh, Plainview, New York. I mean, uh, how did you get going in racing? Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. We uh, the the way I got going really is my father raced for many years. Uh, so I grew up around the racetrack. He raced in Funny Car. He raced in Pro Modified. So I spent a lot of time growing up around the racetrack. And it's so easy to fall in love with this sport. And that's just what happened. So I got my first junior dragster when I was 11. Uh, I was going about 30 miles an hour. But at the time, when you're 11, I felt like the fastest person on the planet. Yes. Right? I had my fire suit on. Especially being from New York, these kids are like, what? You drive a race car? I was like, yeah, check it out. 30 miles an hour, right? And, uh, I think that kind of bred this foundation for myself where I just kept falling in love and uh, I went from there to race bracket bracket style racing and top dragster and I did that with a great individual named Barry Brown that's really where I cut my teeth and learned a lot about what it means to be a good representative a good race car driver from there I raced in top alcohol dragster had a great experience won a few races there and then was fortunate to partner with Dustin Davis and move into the top fuel rank so it was just a natural progression um, and every class that I stepped onto, you know, the, the ultimate goal was always top fuel. But, um, you know, I find that that I've been very fortunate to be surrounded by a lot of really great people. And, and without those people, we wouldn't be in the position that we are today. Well, I th- also think that, that you're uh, well-spoken and you're a good representative for your sponsor. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, to, to me, uh, being a marketing PR guy, that means a lot. And uh, I can tell you that uh, it uh, it's, it's very impressive what you do because, let's face it, you've got thousands of guys that would give anything to be in your shoes. And some of them, r- rightly so. I mean, they're very good race car drivers, let's face it. They are, and I think gratitude is so important because I have the, you know, if you ask me, I have the best job in the world. I mean, I get to do something, like you said, that so many people 
would love to do. And I'm very appreciative. I feel very blessed to be able to do what I do because who else gets to strap into a race car and go over 300 miles per hour in under four seconds? There's so many people that would love to do what I do. And, um, you know, I think the beautiful part about our sport is that it's not about me. It'll never be about me. It's about the team. It's easy to see the race car roll out there and do what it does, but it's about what it takes from a team to actually put the car in a position to go down the racetrack and do what it does. So I love the team aspect of it. And like you said, I'm really fortunate to be able to have this opportunity uh, to be able to drive this race car. I have to so, tell you, that, I'm sorry. I was going to say, from being from New York, do you, do you still live there? You still have a residence? You go back? How does that work? Family? I do. Um, so as we get into the winter months, as I get a little bit older, places like Florida tend to look a little bit <laughs> but, uh, but for now, no. You I, like uh, hanging out with us old people is what you're saying. I don't know about old. You and I clearly have different <laughs> definitions of old. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I love going to Florida, but I am still uh, I am still in New York. I was born and raised in Long Island, New York, and, and I'm still there. Very nice. Um, I, I, I don't remember what I was going to ask you. Um, I, I will tell you that I did watch early, early this morning, couldn't sleep, got up, and was watching NHRA TV and saw a race from 2022. And, you know, I... Uh, did marketing and PR for a top fuel team, the Valvoline team back in 2006 with uh, David Powers. And um, I had an opportunity to get to know the, the guys on the team uh, that actually were in the pits and uh, and got to know them individually and how hard they do work. And, you know, you hear drivers say that, oh, my team, my guys behind me. But it, it, I, the only view that you get at home watching on television or going to the race are the guys that come out there from the pit with the car and they're doing their own, each one doing thrashing. their own job thrashing yeah. to get the car staged up there on the starting line and that's just a brief glimpse of what they do because once that car gets back to the pits i mean it's gloves off everybody is all over that car and it is it, it's a it's a concert if you will of getting that car completely torn down the ballet. and then put it right back together again and take it out racing again. People don't fully understand that. And, and when you go to an NHRA race and get to visit your pit, um, you get to see that in action. And it's truly a miracle the way, the way they do it. Because, you know, I grew up in the school where, well, let's see, I, I got the intake manifold on this weekend. This weekend? What are you kidding me? These guys do it in two minutes. <laughs> Yeah, it's incredible. It's a coordinated dance. It really is a concert or a ballet or however you want to put it. It is something to see. It really is incredible. You have eight to ten guys actually on what we'll call the floor, right, working on the race car, taking it apart, putting it back together, and sometimes under 55 minutes. And these guys are so competitive. We have a clock. We have actually, you know, the clock to know where right, we run. Yeah. Separate clock just to time ourselves. And each and every time they're trying to beat their best which they've done before. So I know that they've gotten, I believe, close to, if not inside of 45 minutes uh, between wow. rounds. Just incredible yeah. to be able to watch what they do and turn this car around. It's uh, it's something to see. And then you drop your 10 millimeter and you got to find it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think that's, that's one of the great things about the NHRA. People can go to the pits, I mean, and, and stand there and kind of see that kind of action going on. You go to NASCAR or someplace, you can't do that. Well, I think NASCAR is getting a little bit better at that. They do have F1's a little bit. F1's not even better. Well, we're not talking about that. <laughs> uh, but at NHRA, it's, it's, it's a family event because you can walk the pitch. You've got all the merchandise trailers. You've got the drivers. You've got the crew chiefs out there. They all sign autographs. Yeah. You know, they're and all walking around. All. They're on yeah. their little bikes going to and from, and you can stop them and, and talk to them. So do you have any wrenching experience yourself? I do not, uh, to be honest with you. Actually, what's fascinated me about racing, you know, you, there's the engineering and the wrenching side. There's the driving side. But I've always been on not only the driving side, but... The business and the sponsorship side. Well, that's, that, 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 that's me. Marketing yeah. and PR. I, I, I have wrenched on my cars, but that was a long time ago. And today, I, I'm pretty much lost. I get the general yeah, idea right. of how an engine works. I got that from my dad. But, uh, you know, it, it, and everybody has a job to do. And 
when you get to your level on the pro level, it's at a much higher level across the board. I know that uh, we had mechanics on the Valvoline team that had been mechanics for years and years and years. We had a clutch guy that flew in from San Antonio to wherever we were. He was the clutch guy. That's all he did. And he was very good at his job. And I know that you've got the guys just like the parts washer. Okay? He's a parts washer. That's where you start, down at the bottom of the totem pole. But by golly, by the end of the season, that guy could wash those parts faster than anybody you could have ever seen. You're right. It's all about specialized knowledge, really. Everybody, if you want to be successful, everybody has their own individual tasks. And collectively, as a team, if you each do your job, you're generally going to put yourself in a good position to be successful. So for me, like the clutch guy has his job, the guy who works on the heads has their job, the guy who works on the bottom end has their job, so on and so forth. So for me, you know, we spoke about that side of the team and the wrenching side, but there's also what we'll call like the support staff side, which is the PR and the marketing, which is the sponsor relations, which is hospitality and the actual people that help to make the business side go. And that side always intrigued me because there's so much B2C in this sport, but there's also a lot of B2B in the sport and the hospitality part of it and being a good representative for your brand and your partners is super important. So I think that the way the sport is built right now, it has to be business first because without success off the racetrack, there is no success on the racetrack and there's no opportunity to even be on the racetrack competing at a high level. So that's kind of where my focus has always been, um, not only at the racetrack, but also during the week is is working with companies like Skag Power Equipment, Toyota, Philips, Lucas Oil, Mac Tools, to be able to do everything we can to represent their brand in the best light and hopefully generate the return on investment that they're looking for due to their involvement in the sport. Mm-hmm. Well, listen, if the driving career goes down the toilet, you're going to be great marketing and PR. <laughs> <laughs> well, Just offer that up. It. You know what? Every, every NHR, NHRA driver does that. Yeah. They're, well, they're, they're, if they all, don't, they have somebody that doesn't Right, but they're all in tune with their specialty, with their sponsors, with their, with their motivation, and with their team. So he's spot on. Yeah. Yeah, no, no doubt. Okay, so uh, what are we going to look for today? How's the weather out there? Things looking good? Yeah, I think it looks really good. It'll be a touch hotter than it was yesterday. We are running in the middle of the day, so we're running noon and 2.30. Um, so I think you'll see something in the mid-70s in terms of air temperature, and uh, I think you'll see a bunch of low 70s, maybe even high 360s today out there on the racetrack from the top fuel car. So uh, weather conditions are good. No rain in the forecast, so uh, all should be good today. It'll be nice and fast out there. Well, it's almost 9 o'clock. What time do you have to be at the track? Right after this. So I'm going to head over there soon. We have a few things to do this morning. Um, but I said, listen, before I leave the hotel, got to make sure I speak to you guys. Oh, hey, man, thank you so much for great. joining we us. Appreciate we're gonna, it. We're going to let you get to the track. Best of luck to you. We'll be watching, and we'll be pulling for you, brother. You so you take care of yourself. Thanks. You too. I appreciate you guys having me on. Thanks for all that you thank do. You. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Justin Ashley, yeah, he's with the Skag. It's always fun to talk to the young guys like yeah, that. Yeah, well, we talked to him, like I said, at, at Baytown. Yeah. yeah. Same down-to-earth, young individual, goal set, goes fast. Well-spoken. Mike wants to be like him. Yeah, And, he, and he's got uh, uh, Mike Green, very successful crew chief, mm-hmm. um, along with uh, Tommy DeLago. So those guys, they, they know what they're doing there. But not only that, they've got all the other teams they can bounce information off of and, and the get, toyota yeah bunch. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. absolutely yep. that makes a big difference all right so uh, we've got a choice here this is the this is the armstrong choice wheel okay. spin the wheel, spin the wheel. <laughs> so are we going to do mars uh 10 micro cars or do you want to do mars auto history well Which that's up to got? mars because well, it sounds like it's a mars day it is the um, micro cars will take a little bit longer okay well then now's the time so what Perfect. do you want to do Let's do we'll the do micro cars. cars. Yeah. So Mars, Mars has a little feature that he's going to do on micro cars. Ten micro cars. Yeah, it's it's um, yeah, kind of in 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 between cars on doing car reviews. So we decided to come up with something here. Okay. So the micro cars we're talking about smaller, smaller, smaller cars. Now just to set the stage, this first one is a twenty twenty five Mini Cooper, okay. and the reason is that so you kind of get an idea what we're comparing things to. This vehicle is uh. 12.7 feet long. I was going to say 10. But 6.4 feet wide and 4.6 <laughs> feet tall. So so it's like two Don Armstrongs long. That's right. <laughs> it's a pocket racer. All right. So we'll go over here. Let's go to the next one, number 10. Now, this is the Scion IQ. 
Now it's ten feet long. And Scion. Five foot they don't wide. wait a minute. They don't make scions anymore. Well, I know some of these cars are the out European. of production. Okay, well, a lot of the European cars are. That smaller. car is really, really ugly. And it's ten feet long, <laughs> five feet wide, two seater, disguised as a four seater, and uh, <laughs> it's disguised it, as a semi truck. It had ninety eight horsepower. So. Then we come to the Fiat 500. Now, not the Fiat 500 you see these days. Not the one your mom told you about. Yeah, that's like 12 feet long. Now, this is the early version. It was actually made from 1957 to 1975, and it's 9 feet 9 inches long. <laughs> And it ran on a 479. Have you ever CC been in one? Engine. Oh my I, I've God. I've seen one in California it on the freeway. It's so tiny. I, uh, for, I'm six foot one. I could, I don't even know how I got in the car. Yeah, I certainly is, had a hard time no, getting it, out. It's like they got 12 inch wheels on. This is a five passenger. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. And then we get to the Dahatsu Fellow Max. Oh, Dahatsu. Dahatsu. Yeah. Oh, now, th- this was go. less than 10 feet long. Uh, a little more than four feet wide, but it had a 356 cubic inch, nobody, cubic centimeter. Nobody cares. Engine. It's got a mole on the hood it's, there. It's smaller than most new Honda motorcycles. That's a skin Engines. tag. <laughs> That's a skin <laughs> tag. The Mahindra E20. We're moving on. Mahindra, they make tack, uh, tractors, tractor, yeah. don't they? Yep. And there it is. The E20 Mahindra. measures 129 yeah. inches long That's and 59 so inches wide. What's the wheelbase? Six. 129 inches. So it's a little bit longer. Oh, okay. That, that, that's ugly, too. But we're going to step over here to the Reba. I think that's how you say it. G-Wiz. Reba. Like it's in Reba McIntyre? Oh, R-V, R-E-V-A. Oh, Reba. Reba. G-Wiz. <laughs> it's less than nine feet long. Oh. It's uh, built in India. It's an electric car. It's supposedly... It looks it, like a, five, a size five shoe. <laughs> well... <laughs> Supposedly, it would hold two adults and two children and no. carry 600 pounds. I would say but, tub it out. <laughs> but it would only go 50 miles an hour and it would go 48 on miles it. on a charge. Dude, can you imagine going around the corner in that thing? would tump over. <laughs> then we get to the Renault Twizy. That's Uh-oh. the Renault. 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 Ooh, I oh like it. God. It's like a razor. <laughs> Eight <laughs> foot <laughs> electric quadricycle, three doors. And uh, it's looks like an still being produced, but comes uh, up. yeah, uh-huh. it's twenty six miles to one charge. But it's eight foot long. That's all it is. Oh, Less sh- than a dawn. No, it's a dawn and a quarter. <laughs> so we get to the Buddy Electric. Now this was produced <laughs> and sold in Norway. This car is eight foot long, and it comes with a Norwegian accent. And it's supposed to. <laughs> it's, it's got a little baby cone. Yeah, it sits uh, three people on a bench seat. <laughs> oh my God, a Buddy. <laughs> Yep, and uh, it will have oh, a range your buddies of if you sit with that one. 49 <laughs> miles, and it takes six hours to charge for 49 miles. Okay. That is Getting really- to the commuter cars toga. Tar- toga. Commuter cars tango. This vehicle is three feet wide. Oh, well, more. And it's eight we foot done. long. No, we got two more. Okay. Um, Ooh. Oh, my God. And you can charge it on your dryer outlet. Now, the number two is like Myers Sparrow. This is a two-door hatchback version. <laughs> it's like a high heel shoe. It's eight foot long. It's a three-wheeler. Top speed is 70 miles an hour. It'll range to 60 miles. Downhill. I have a red pump that looks just oh, yeah, like that. Was, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> Put your hairy leg in it. Look good. And then we get to the one, the Peel P50. What? P50 is 54 inches long, 41 <laughs> inches wide. It, had, it, for, it held the Guinness World Records title of the smallest car for more than 50 years it's got one seat in it it's no it's a 49 cc go 28 miles an hour and that vehicle is still legal in the uk oh my god well that's you know those people there's something weird with some of those people over (laughs) there uk what can you say i got a younger uncle from over there it's got wheelbarrow tires on it (laughs) yeah and it looked like it had like a park bench as a seat well yeah but it ain't near long enough for it to be a park bench all right no it's for one person so all right all right, okay. well, um, are we going to do auto history here? We're going to do that later. Uh, your call. Okay, well, we're going to no. do that later. We're not going to do that. We're going we're gonna, we're gonna to do uh, this first. And I, I guess that we, we played those commercials, huh? We're going to break two. We're going to break yeah, number okay, two. Okay, all right. Uh, auto industry designing the cars of tomorrow to be electric, so the cars of tomorrow land are being electrified too. 
The Disneyland Resort in Anaheim, California, plans to get rid of the internal combustion engines that for decades have filled the air around the Autopia attraction with exhaust fumes. I knew that we were going to go there. Autopia. American Honda has sponsored Autopia since 2016 when it replaced Chevron. As part of a 10-year sponsorship deal with Disneyland, the automaker paid for a reimbursement I'm sorry, a refurbishment that included putting eight and a half horsepower versions of the IGX series engines into the ride's 96 cars, which now wear Honda logos and colors. The cars meander along a nearly half mile track at a maximum speed of six and a half miles an hour. Paul Scott, an activist who has uh, complained to the California Air Resources Board about Autopia's fumes, said Disney's choice of powertrain sets a powerful example to its young visitors. Go electric. Okay, fine. There you go. Yeah. Then there's something to be said for gasoline engines that have that that lawnmower sound to them. At least it, you feel like, hey, you know, I'm in a car. Mm-hmm. I don't know about an electric car. They'd be kind of like driving the golf cart, the electric golf cart. Yeah. It, it, it's, they're very quiet. And, and to be honest, it's been a year since I've been to one of the Disney parks or any place that oh, had a ride went, like that. But yeah. it's, I don't remember smelling anything. No. no. You put a, a playing card in the spokes with a, with a yeah yeah make the noise. I used to do that. Mm-hmm. That and balloons. Balloons. Balloons were good. Oh, uh, balloons made it sound like a Harley. They didn't last very potato, long. Potato, 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 potato. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but if you went real fast, then there was a lot of potatoes. Well, then you blow your balloon. Uh, well, there's that. Yeah. I hate it when I blow my balloon. Mm. If you've done that, well, Sergeant uh, Woodard will help you with that. And, and breathalyzer. First retail trim of the 2024 Chevy Silverado EV <laughs> will have a longer range and a lower starting price when it goes on sale this year. The Silverado EV RST First Edition should go on sale soon with a General Motors estimated 440 miles of range, up from an earlier estimate of 400 miles, Chevy said Wednesday. The brand also confirmed the RST will start at how much? 62000 Mars? Uh, all so electric. All electric. I'll, I'll go to fifty. They're going. They're trying to cut the price. Okay. Um, the brand confirmed that the price will be ninety six thousand oh, four hundred and ninety five dollars okay. with shipping. <laughs> oh God. Less with shipping. Less than the one hundred and six thousand eight hundred and ninety five dollars starting price Chevy previously provided. So you're right. They did cut the price. Okay. Who's going to buy that? Not me. I'm still looking for a hot rod. I I send you these and you and you don't act on them. No. You know, your car's been paid for for years. I mm-hmm. think it's time for you to get into uh one of the Haggerty. I'm sorry, one of the Hemmings, Hemmings. cars uh because <laughs> you, you I give you all these really cool cars, especially the Cadillacs yeah. and you never act on it. I know. We'd love to hear from you. Shoot us an email. The address here is info at inwheeltime.com. Time now for a quick break. You're on the In Wheel Time Car Talk Show, streaming and podcasting around the planet. Look for us on your favorite provider. Are you ready? We're going to take this break. Yep. The original group of Loopy Tortilla Restaurants will have you telling your family and friends just what the original recipes mean when it comes to the best fajitas in Southeast Texas. Founder Stan Holt invites you to visit the original Loopy Tortilla near I-10 and Highway 6. Here's the original house that inspired the design of all the rest and the original charm that helped make Loopy Tortilla the go-to destination for Houston Tex-Mex. Speaking of original, nothing can compete with the original lime pepper marinade that everyone will agree makes Loopy Tortilla award-winning beef it is the best anywhere. Loopy Tortilla Katie is another location that gives you the same quality and service Houstonians have come to expect at Loopy's. It's located just off I-10 in the Grand Parkway at Kingsland Boulevard in Katy. Find yourself in Aggie Land? Head to the Loopy Tortilla in College Station, located just around the corner from Kyle Field. It's a great place to enjoy those famous frozen margaritas before or after the game. Headed east to Louisiana? Stop in at the Loopy Tortilla in Beaumont. It twos on I-10. You can't miss it. The original group of Loopy Tortilla restaurants invites you in for the best Tex-Mex anywhere. You own a car you love. Well, why not let Gulf Coast Auto Shield protect it? Houstonian John Gray invites you to his state-of-the-art facility to introduce you to his specialist team of auto enthusiasts. We promise you'll be impressed. Whether you're looking to massage your original paint to a like-new appearance, apply a ceramic coating, install a paint protection film, nano-ceramic window tent, or new windshield protection called ExoShield, Gulf Coast Auto Shield is where Houston's car people go. Curbed your wheels? Instead of buying new, why not have them repaired? 
How about a professionally installed radar detector? Gulf Coast Auto Shield does that too. Get a peek inside the shop and look at the services offered by getting online and heading to gcautoshield.com. Better yet, stop by their facility at 11275 South Sam Houston Tollway, just south of the Southwest Freeway, and get a personal tour. Gulf Coast Auto Shield is your place to go for all things exterior. Call them today, 832-930-5655 or gcautoshield.com. That's it for this podcast episode of the In Wheel Time Car Show. I'm Don Armstrong, inviting you to join us for our live show every Saturday morning, 8 to 11 a.m. Central on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and our InWheelTime.com website. Podcasts are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeart Podcast, Podcast Addict, TuneIn, 